Beyond Lumina, Episode 17, The Storm. You have failed, a menacing, otherworldly voice hissed. By allowing that creature to arrive on Inagon, you have endangered my prime objective and my plans here. You must either drive that creature away before it sees what I am planning here, or kill it before it can escape. If you cannot, then it will be your death I seek in retribution. Of course, O oh Great One, replied a deep voice, though it was filled with a primordial fear. I will not fail you again, or it will be your doom. In the northern reaches of Ravina, in the region of Animov, the Ravinian citizens, who were living in the large bunker, which was destroyed, were a little safer than before, due to the cache of gear that Hawk and Argyle found in the back of the cave they now occupied, no doubt in Hawk's mind put there by Zario. It included tools to both heat and purify water, as well as start fires easily, and so for the time being the citizens were not on the verge of death. Once they knew the others were secure, Hawk took Argyle again out on the grab bikes, back to the massive smoldering building. It looked to them, for the most part, to be nearly burned out, but they needed to take a closer and cautious look to be absolutely certain. Entering the facility, they came to the main room, whose lofty ceiling was mostly intact. As long as it was structurally safe, it wouldn't pose a problem to warmth. They were able to search rather quickly the communal side of the building, putting out a few small fires as they went, but that part had enough rooms intact that the citizens could come back immediately, as long as they were sure the military side of the bunker was clear. The side where the crew's ship and home, the Fangcrest, should have been docked, but there was no sign of it. Zarya won't be happy when we tell him, Argyle observed. Their main concern was for the part of the facility that was the basement of the main area, but it too was mostly intact. The fires throughout were also all nearly burnt out. The explosion was less about bringing down the fortified bunker, and more about destroying everything, and everyone, inside. It didn't take too long before they were able to start transporting some of the civilians back to the bunker, and in a couple rotations, everyone was safe inside once again. Basic supplies were mostly gone as well, and so the crew had to make some runs to the nearest towns, a long way away, to restock some of the Rubinian supplies. Once the civilians were secure, Hawk, Mecca, and Argyle left them in each other's care, along with a grav car for their own transport. The trio then made their way back south toward Cronus Prime and Pania, and toward the battle. Azik, Chifoshu, Vala, and all the Inagon warriors prepared back in the capital city for their assault on the Ascendancy facility on the opposing coast. It took a little more convincing of the chief that Azik wouldn't be a hindrance to the mission after seeing his several severe headaches since getting to know him better. But eventually Azik convinced him that they wouldn't pose a problem. The natives had their own rituals for preparing for such an immense battle, but all prior festivities were forgotten to help conceal their plans from the enemy. The scouting was complete, and the time had come for action. Azik saw the chief speaking once more with what he assumed were his daughters before finally joining the rest of the forces and marching off. Azik's curiosity got the better of him. If you don't mind me asking, he started, are those your daughters? What were you saying to them just now? Hoshu looked at him for a moment, trying to gauge what his reaction might be to his answer. I was warning them not to follow us, not even to the edge of the forest. They are indeed my daughters. Kita and Katash are their names, and they are too curious for their own good. And they only grew worse when the Supreme Order arrived. 
before they could be kept safe by my warriors during their mischievous wanderings through the forest. But now it is no longer so safe. It was extremely reckless of them to bring you back. They were only lucky that it turned out to be you. I will not have them throwing their lives away through such foolishness. I suppose I see what you mean, Azik replied, although they did seem like they could handle themselves pretty well. Until reality intervenes, the chief retorted solemnly. You, of all people, should know the realities of war, Lieutenant Zinn. Yes, I guess you're right, Azik said. But perhaps they feel they want to defend their home as well. I see you off-worlders have very different customs in this regard, Oshu answered. But understand, Azik, they are the home we are protecting. Azik thought of his own family. Maybe I do understand, he finally conceded. Vala, overhearing the conversation nearby, did not, however, understand. Azik noticed that she had also been more quiet than usual ever since returning from the scouting trip. The war party reached the coves, where they entered and crept down into the lower passages, where pools of water led through underwater tunnels back out to the sea, but near the opposite shoreline, where the Ascendancy base was located. The natives were sure that the off-world soldiers had no idea about the underwater network, once the first unit of the forces filtered in, the chief spoke to them all in their native tongue, explaining once more the plan and the what they may expect on the other side. Azik and Vala were already aware from their prior conversations with the chief. They were to descend into the water. The natives could hold their breath while Azik and Vala would use their standard issue breathing devices and swim through the submerged caverns until coming out full force, nearly on the beaches of the Ascendancy, where the battle would immediately commence. Azik and Vala, with their breathers, would go first and wait for the first wave of natives, led by one who Azik took to be the captain of the warriors, named Ankh, then cover them with their concentrated plasma pistols as they storm the shore. Once the chief was finished speaking, he gave Azik and Vala the signal and they descended into the water. An armored grav car sped south through the ever-warming, rocky landscape of Ravina toward the capital city of Cronus Prime. There were only five passengers, Balanth, Master Omen, and three Ascendancy soldiers. As they quickly neared Cronus Prime, Balanth saw a most unnerving sight. Omen noticed the small change of expression on Balanth's face. That's right, Omen said. The invasion has begun. This guy, as far as Balanth could see, was filled with Royal Ascendancy warships and carriers, entering the atmosphere of Ravina and landing at the Cronus Prime spaceport, which was now already overrun with mere soldiers. But how did they get around the Alliance ships so easily? Balanth couldn't help but ask. That's a good question, the Ascendancy Master chuckled, as though he knew something he wasn't going to reveal. Perhaps they were caught being complacent, not out of the ordinary for those free worlders, isn't that right? Just then, the comms came on, and a weathered voice came through the other end. Master, he began, we've run into the rebels again and they're causing problems for us in the canyons. I've already lost a squad to the purple-eyed wretches. What would you have me do? Omen looked annoyed for a moment, then glanced at Balanth and had a glimmer in his eye again. Retreat and track them, Gore. He then said to the soldier on the other end, I think I've got a way to deal with them for good. The comms then closed, and the Ascendancy Master again turned to his captive. Looks like your earlier mission is back on, mercenary. You're going to go take care of that rebel nuisance for me, right now. Zario lay on a cold metal experiment table, 
his body racked with pain. He had been fading in and out of consciousness for longer than he can remember, time beginning to drift together. He hadn't any idea how long he had been there. The cold gray laboratory was dark aside from the various monitors and data stations gleaming. Then the door to the lab opened and the bright lights automatically blared on, startling and nearly blinding Zario. The doctor had returned. Awake once again, I see. That's good. The mad scientist smiled. Perhaps we can run a few more tests before you take another rest. The doctor approached the table next to Zario, where his equipment was already spread out and prepared. I must say, he started speaking again. Some of the results from your blood and DNA tests were very promising to my research. To show my deep gratitude for your help, I'll be sure to do my best to keep you alive as long as possible. Who knows what else we may discover through you. The doctor then got to work, humming some haunting tune as he ran tests on the helpless Zario. The mercenary leader couldn't help but scream out in pain at the tortuous treatment he received at the psychotic physician's hands. Nonchalantly doing his work, he also made small talk with his patient. You know, the doctor began at one point. I heard a most interesting bit of news when I was away earlier. Seems your friends, Azig Zin and the others, are alive and well somewhere on the planet still. But for some reason, the High Master is not at all happy about that, and is actively hunting them down. Between you and me, I've never seen him so worked up before in my life, and I've known him for a very long time. And I have witnessed some frightening episodes with him. I wonder what your friend possibly could have done. Either way, it is not going to turn out well for him, or any of his allies. The High Masters have even decided to, shall we say, finish Castia as well. It doesn't bode well for anyone who might happen to be there either when the time comes. Zario caught pieces of the madman's monologue, but could barely make sense of it through the excruciating pain. Though the doctor kindly asked him not to, Zario eventually succumbed to the brutal treatment once again, and blacked out. Can you pick anything up on your feed? Hawk asked his comrades, Mecha and Argyle, riding the other of the two grav bikes Zarya had stored in Animov, southward toward Cronus Prime, the capital of Ravina. Nothing yet, Mecha replied, seated behind Argyle, who was steering. Wait, she amended, as she began catching some bit of interference. There is something, I think. After another moment, she tuned into what sounded like an emergency broadcast for Ravina, telling any citizens in need to make their way to a nearby military outpost. Many had quickly been set up for relief, so they could be transported to the southern continent where they would be safest from the carnage. She relayed the message to the others as she heard it. We should head down there then, Hawk replied. If Otteron's going anywhere with Valanth, it's probably there to continue where he left off in Animov. It looks like the quickest route there will be through the canyons, Mecha advised after checking the map. The canyons were a major landmark even in the craggy surface of Ravina, for the numerous deep fissures each spread for hundreds of miles. Most traffic that would travel the length or breadth of the planet near that hemisphere would almost surely make its way through the canyons. All right then, let's go. Hawk commanded, and the two grav bikes kicked into high gear and sped through the warming, rocky landscape of Ravina. The chief's right-hand man, Honk, swam through the last bit of underwater cavern that led out to the open sea, along with his elite fighting force, and there met Azik and Vala for the initial onslaught of the Ascendancy-controlled coastline. Donning their breathing devices with concentrated plasma pistols drawn, 
the two off-worlders led the natives from the waters. By the time they surfaced, they were within earshot of the beaches, and also within a weapon range. Two startled Ascendancy guards nearest their position tried to quickly take aim, but Azik was quicker, dispatching both before they had a chance. Vala then joined him as the other nearby guards were alerted to the ambush, but they were caught totally off guard without having had any reason to suspect an entire army was waiting on their doorstep. The natives eventually came into range and began covering them with their own strange projectile weapons as the attackers established a position on the beachhead. Azik took to the front lines with two concentrated plasma blades, luckily still left by drop the Ascendancy leader after the crash, along with several other weapons the three fake pirates were carrying. The ex-Alliance lieutenant bobbed, weaved, and parried the oncoming plasma fire with expert precision. The natives' projectile weapons, while strange, were still quite effective. They found a way to hone what seemed to be their own native Ethereum into small pellets that could fire at incredible speeds and even pierce through synth plate. Azik then knew it was not only due to the ascendancy that there was Ethereum on this planet, which he had wondered ever since their escape pod had been shot down. While Vala led the main advance with another of the native leaders, Azik led Chief Oshu, Ankh, and his men on a frontal assault of the lightly guarded fortress. Most of the guardsmen being dealt with early, the entire fighting force quickly made it to an entrenched position near the main gate. Azik and the chief's crew seized an opportunity to infiltrate the base when the first wave of reinforcements then began retreating back inside. Once within the facility, the small group of native warriors, plus Azik, were confronted by the officers of the Royal Ascendancy, who finally joined the rest of the garrison. Destroy them all! The leader, I Master, commanded with a menacing grim. Azik was slightly surprised to see one of the High Masters here. Oshu would have had no idea that this man was such a high rank in the Ascendancy military not having known of the Ascendancy by name at all. A captain and his lieutenant, known in the Ascendancy as a Master and Low Master, were with him, along with several other lower-ranking officer-class soldiers, known as leaders. I'll take the leader, Isaac began. Get the other two with him. But Chief Oshu stopped him. No, I will battle their leader. This is my home, not yours. There was no time to argue. The skirmish was upon them. The High Master was protected by his subordinates, however, and the Chief and Azik were engaged by the two other Captain-class soldiers. Ankh helped the other natives fight their way to the nearby door controls, took the position from the enemy, and let the rest of their forces reposition at the entrance and join the fight. Things were going rather smoothly. Azik thought they should consider themselves lucky that only one of the High Master's three subordinate Masters and his Low Master was here with them, or else they may have been a little outnumbered. Master Dark, right, Azik said to the seasoned Ascendancy officer that faced him. Your face is well known in the Alliance. As is yours now, Azik Zin, replied the big Amir warrior before launching his first attack against Azik with his own concentrated plasma blade. Azik had already holstered one of his own, and fought Master Dark blade to blade. Next to him, Chief Oshu was also wielding one of the concentrated plasma blades with expertise. His opponent, Azik could guess, was Low Master Call, the subordinate of Master Dark. Azik saw a lot of similarity between the Inagonians and his own people, for they both highly regarded skills within Aetherblade, Ethereum naturally occurring on both of their worlds. Oshu was also the greatest of his people's warriors, and a new weapon was no problem for him, especially since the Plasma Blade wasn't meant to be a difficult weapon to wield in the first place. Azik and Master Dark parried back and forth, the Ascendancy leader was a formidable opponent, 
and Azik was glad Oshu was fighting the Low Master. Despite being a great warrior, the chief had never faced a threat like the Ascendancy in combat before. He held his own well against Kal, though, and the tide continued to push in their favor. Vala and the other natives arrived to take control of the doorway, leaving Ankh and the others to join in the frontal assault. Just then, another mere warrior appeared from the ramparts just above with another crew of soldiers. The one leading them jumped down, his concentrated plasma blade aimed at Vala. Seeing the reinforcements arrive, Ankh turned back just in time to block the blow before it fell, which sliced his aether blade in two. Without missing a beat, however, Ankh charged and kicked the newly arrived warrior, knocking him away from the half-shocked Vala, who could only thank the native with a look. Coming to her senses, Vala finally recognized her attacker. It was one of the soldiers from back on the Ascendancy ship. It was Krag. She then called to Ankh, threw him her own concentrated plasma blade, and let him take care of the Ascendancy leader. Azik, meanwhile, continued his duel with Master Dark, who took an opportunity in the midst of a fight he was losing to try and throw Azik off. Your friend Zario is enjoying his stay here. It didn't quite get the reaction he had hoped for, so he added, He's the special guest of our own very renowned doctor. With that, Azik's head began to swim, and confused images came to mind. The doctor, he thought hard to remember him. He knew he did. Then, a painful headache gripped him and sent him to the ground. Balanth lay in the prone position, his plasma rifle trained on his target nearly half a mile away. The rebel leader was easy to spot amongst the rest of the combatants, because he had a presence that was hard to miss. Not to mention a shock of long blonde hair on his unguarded head. He had to wait a while before acquiring his target, because the fake Ravinians had retreated at the end of the rotation and the canyon remained held by the rebels until the following rotation. That's when Captain Alderon, Master Omen, took Valanth to snipe the rebel leader. Well, what are you waiting for, mercenary? Master Omen goaded Valanth. Take the shot. I know this distance is no issue for you. Your men are down there too, Valanth replied. You wouldn't want me hitting one of them by mistake, would you? Let me worry about my subordinates, and you just do what you're told, Omen spat back. Unless you want me to begin the torture of your friends, starting with, Will you quit rushing me? Balanth interrupted him. I'm here, aren't I? Just let me do the job right. He refocused his sight in the scope of the rifle, and when he did, he noticed an approaching grab bite and then another. As they came into better view, they both stopped short of the battle once they saw it and seemed to be discussing what they should do. Once they chose to enter the fight themselves, Balanth could see who was riding them. Balanth quickly rolled from his position, taking aim now at Master Omen with the rifle. Omen too, however, had seen who the new arrivals were, and that he had lost his bargaining chip. It was Hawk, Mecha, and Argyle. Omen was able to knock the rifle away in time, drawing his concentrated plasma blade and striking at Balan, but not before Balan snatched one of the other soldiers' blades and parried the attack. He cut down two of the soldiers with Omen before the Ascendancy Master fled the battle with the other. Valent then quickly made his way down to his friends in the fight. The other three, Hawk, Mecha, and Argyle, meanwhile rode into the canyon, making contact with the commander of the rebels in the back lines. The three came to a stop, dismounted their grab bikes, and Hawk led the others with their hands open, hoping to show the rebels they meant no harm. Peace, Hawk started once an earshot. We came to help. If you're not Ascendancy and you're fighting Ravinian soldiers, 
You must know that they're fake. So do we. Who are you? The commander asked, weapon at the ready. Mercenaries who were captured by the Ascendancy and these guys, Hawk replied. Don't worry, we're friends of Ravina. The commander didn't think too long about it. You look like you know how to handle yourselves, and we could use some help out there. I'm afraid things aren't going our way. They managed to outflank us, and it doesn't seem we'll hold out here much longer. How bad is it? Hawk asked. You need us to find you a way out? If you can open up the Western Pass, the rebel commander started, pointing toward a way through the canyons. I think we'd be able to make a retreat. Consider it done. Get ready to get out of here, Hawk said. But then, not too far off, on an outcropping of the cliff, they heard and saw a plasma rifle blast blink down into the fray. Several more shots followed. Hawk, Mecca, and Argyle knew exactly who it was. Hey, what's your name? Hawk asked the commander. Proust, the rebel replied. I take back what I said, Proust, Hawk said with a smile. Instead, we're just gonna go win you this fight. Meanwhile, the leader of the Rivenian rebels glided through the enemy ranks, a shock of blonde hair flowing behind him, slicing with his aether blade and shouting rallying calls as well as insults as he went. Let's go, teach these fakers a lesson. Ravina's not gonna be their pawn. Making his way into the midst of the enemy ranks, he spotted their commander, Flowmaster Gore, slowly coming toward him. Barnes, he shouted back to one of his comrades. Get my back, will ya? You got it, replied a larger man with unkept brown locks over his face, who was fending off multiple assailants, trying to reach his leader. His aether plate provided ample protection but he was still swarmed by the multitude of pseudo rabinian soldiers between him and the rebel leader, who was just about to clash with the low master who was posed as the lieutenant of the troop. Just then a concentrated plasma rifle shot rang out through the canyon from above, causing everyone to take at least a moment to see who had released it. One fake soldier near Barnes dropped to the ground from the impact, then another shot was fired and another soldier close to him fell. The fight was back on shortly after, and Barnes found his way to the commander clear. Kama, he shouted over the fray once he arrived. Ha! The rebel leader turned for a split second to laugh over his shoulder. I knew you'd make it, buddy! Then he parried the Lowmaster's attack and won on the offensive with his incredible sword skills. Hawk, Mecha, and Argyle soon made it to the battle, where Mecha and Argyle took up positions toward the left flank, near the cliff where Valanth was perched. Hawk covered them with his own plasma pistol, as well as his personal weapon customized by Philony himself, an elongated stun blade which activates on both ends. Due to Zario's foresight, an extra one had been stashed in the Animov cave, along with many other weapons. All things being equal, Hawk preferred not to kill if he could help it, so Philony developed a weapon for him to produce maximal effect with minimal casualties. The extra firepower coming into the fight unopposed quickly started turning the tide of battle in favor of the rebels. Barnes held off the grunts while the rebel leader, Kama, had Lowmaster Gore on the ropes. Dealing him a critical blow, Gore dropped his weapon and Kama pointed his blade at him, waiting for his surrender. The other fake Ravinian soldiers, seeing their commander lose, started to flee the battle one by one. Well, low master, Kama the rebel said to the ascendancy leader, looks like you're coming with us. We can do this the easy way or the hard way. He turned and began to walk back to his crew. Lowmaster Gore took the opportunity to pull another plasma pistol from his side and take aim at the rebel leader. Barnes, Kama's right-hand man, however, was right next to him and knocked the Lowmaster out cold before he got a shot off. The hard way, looks like, Kama chuckled. 
the Ravinian rebels had won the battle.